All right, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today with Patricia Riesick. She is PhD, ABPP, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University. She has received many grants, including grants from the NIH, NIJ, CDC, SAMHSA, VA, DOD, for her innovative work in developing and testing cognitive processing therapy. She has written two books, one called Cognitive Processing Therapy for PTSD and Getting Unstuck from PTSD. She has another textbook on the way. Um, she is recently retired, but very busy from what I hear, giving grand rounds and writing and doing all the things that would forward and further the work that she has spent her life doing. She's published over nine books, 250 journal articles, and she has worked with countless PTSD patients. And so I thought I would start by asking her some questions about her journey into this important work. And then I really want to focus in on what um, cognitive processing therapy is and and kind of the uh, what I would say the pearls that we can glean from it. Um, this will not replace you know, a training in this or supervision, but maybe we'll give you a taste of, you know, what are some of the stuck points that people have when they have a traumatic event and how using more of a cognitive therapy approach can actually help get them out of that stuck point. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You were part of the first cohort of rape crisis counselors in the mid 1970s. Um, how did this impact you at the time and your future work with trauma patients? Um, I was on internship in South Carolina at the Medical University of South Carolina and the VA hospital. And I was approached um, by a couple of people who were setting up one of the first, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the first rape crisis centers in the country. Um, I had been working with children before that. And that was my area of research and um, thought that, that was gonna be my career. And then when I started working with the rape victims, I realized, you know, I was asked to, to do a symposium for Southeast Psychological Association. And uh, one of my uh, fellow students and I did a complete review. And of course, we had no computers back then. So I was looking issue by issue of um, psychological abstracts. Um, I think that's what it was called back then. I don't remember. Um, but anyway, it was volume by volume looking through the indexes and there was, we could only find four articles on the topic of rape and they were all like horrible. Um, so we then got um, uh, the word that the federal government, NIMH, was going to be funding research, $3 million, which back in 1970s money is pretty big to fund research on um, the effects of rape. Um, so I was working as a rape crisis counselor and getting called out in the middle of the night and learning a lot about kind of like how women were um, responding. Mostly they were numb, um, not saying much, but sometimes the family members were fairly outrageous. Um, and um, the doctors took forever and were untrained at the time to do rape kits. Now they have the same program and nurses do that in most places or many mm -hmm. places. Um, but we started doing research um, and my whole field shifted because everything we learned was new. Um, there was there was absolutely nothing in the field. So um, everything we learned was important. Well, even if we didn't have a finding, it was important. So you, yeah, you were really learning from of observation and what was, what was some of the bad that you saw, like maybe the physicians, the bad things physicians would do in interacting with patients? Well, typically it wouldn't be that it would be some intern or, or a resident or something that would do the rape exam and they were fairly rough. Um, you know, the, 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 the blame they didn't under, I mean, literally people did not understand what rape was. I had a psychiatrist actually ask me, what's the big deal about rape? Isn't that just sex? Um, mm. it's like, what? Really, 
they didn't understand. They literally did not understand uh. that it was traumatic um, because it wasn't called traumatic. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's, you know, it's mind blowing that, I mean, this is like 50, 50 years later, but it's mind blowing that that wasn't considered traumatic back then. That's just like, I, it, it's well, hard there for was, me to conceptualize there was no, that. There was no field of traumatic stress. I mean, the um, PTSD wasn't, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder was not even put in the DSM until 1980. So when I started working in the 70s, people were just then starting to talk about rape trauma syndrome, child abuse syndrome, uh, Vietnam veteran syndrome, and they started realizing they were all talking about the same thing. Um, yeah. And then when it came, got into the DSM, people started taking it more seriously and saying, oh, and it was put with the anxiety disorders. And it's like, okay, this is a real thing. Um, and before that, usually with wars, as soon as the war was over, people would forget about it and they wouldn't think about these diagnoses. And of course, before that, it was things like shell shock and combat fatigue and things like that. Um, they just didn't understand the nature of trauma and how lasting it could be. Yeah. So, so you were in the midst of it. You, you submitted um, two grants and mm -hmm. both were funded. Yeah. I and... wasn't the guy since I was still a grad student, but I helped okay. write them. Yeah. And, and what, um, yeah. What were some of the early findings that shaped your future trajectory? Well, we did launch, we, both of these studies were longitudinal studies. One looked at fear and anxiety and the other one, uh, it, when I went back to Georgia to finish my um, di my dissertation, we wrote a grant application looking at depression and, and seeing what happened with depression. And you could see that um, a fair number of people recovered, but there was a fair number who didn't recover over the period of time we were studying them over the year that we studied them. And we had some initial efforts in Charleston. I, now, of course, this grant went on after I left um, and, and took an academic job um, up in South Dakota. Um, but we were trying to treat them or have rape crisis counselors treat them um, and didn't do a very good job. We didn't understand acute stress disorder. There was no such thing. Um, okay. And most people didn't want to get treated early on. That's, that's still the case. Most people just like don't want to think about it, don't want to deal with it, I want to pretend it didn't happen. If I ignore it, it'll it'll go away and stop bothering me. Um, so getting people to even intervene now and get help early is still a problem, but it was even more so of a problem yeah. that we didn't have any idea what to do. Okay. And then so initially you had like an anxiety perspective on PTSD, if, if I, if I read that correctly. And then you looked, you looked at, um, this one study where assertiveness training was one of the three arms. Oh yeah. And there was not much of a difference between them. Well, yeah, the, the very first study I did was, uh, I had some funding from, um, the university I was at and I, I looked at, um, assertiveness training. Um, and I looked at more of a psychodynamic condition and supportive treatment and and they were all the same of course some of it had to do with the fact they were small studies but um i was also hearing in the process of doing therapy with these women that that they weren't always talking about fear and anxiety sometimes they said i didn't i didn't think he was going to kill me it was my husband or it was my ex-boyfriend but what he did was so humiliating to me he betrayed me um so they were describing horror and and shame and guilt and saying, what did I do wrong? Why did he do this to me? Like I must have done something wrong. And so it really got me heading in a whole different direction than the anxiety disorders. I started looking, reading um, Aaron Beck's work on depression and the cognitive therapy that he was doing. And he was also working in, you know, he was started with depression and then moved to anxiety. So I, I could see that perhaps looking at, um, the cognitions would be a way to get to um, a change in emotions and get rid of some of the the guilt and the self blame and the um, and the shame that they felt and that sort of thing. Yeah, so it sounds like you you were seeing more than just anxiety and fear. It was like shame. It was disgust. It was betrayal. Yeah. Um, and it sounded like you shifted to Beck's CBT approach, um, or you shifted his approach by going back to the traumatic memory and to look at where the client's thinking developed. Um, tell me about this. 
Well, Beck's work mostly was because he was working with depression and more general anxiety. They were focused on the here and now. And it just seemed like we needed to go back and actually work on their beliefs about the trauma before you could work on the here and now. Um, and I think that's probably the case. Um, I mean, you do get some effect by working on the here and now, but, but you're not going to really resolve it until you resolve their thinking and their emotions about the trauma itself. The other thing that was different is that the, the original manuals that I was seeing that were being produced were, I got done reading them and say, yeah, I get the approach, but I don't know what to do. Mm. <laughs> so I really wanted a protocol that kind of laid it out, especially because I was thinking at the time in the, in the very beginning that I was going to be working with rape crisis counselors and, and, um, victim assistance programs and things like that, because I wasn't a field in psychology. Psychologists were not working with trauma victims. Hmm. So I wanted a therapy that would be like session one, do this session two, do this session three, do this. And we were doing group treatment because that's how they were tending to be treated, like in the hmm. rape centers and so forth, they would be in, in getting groups, um, at least as where I was. So that's how I ended up developing CPT is like as a very specific protocol. Okay. And um, you stated you would work with like the index trauma, like the first time someone had some sort of type of trauma before, and you would be looking for a type of um, belief, like a over accommodated belief where it's like, I always make bad decisions. No one can be trusted. I must control everyone around me is tell, can you tell me about that am i getting that right or well, those are the here and now and the future and those are the result of what they said to themselves about the trauma so if they say i made a mistake i must have done something wrong for this to happen to me then their logical conclusions is i can't trust my own judgment or if they say it happened because um i was in a dangerous place well then, then they jump to the conclusion that the world is entirely dangerous. Like they take it too far. That's why we call it over accommodated. Accommodated would be oh, this bad oh, thing happened to me. Okay. Okay. Let me, let me phrase this different. So you would not start with the over accommodated belief. No, that's what we finish with. That's, that's what you finish with. Therapy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so right. Like I am always, I always make bad decisions. So someone who's not taking a trauma approach may start with that belief and start to work on that. But what you would do is you would go back to the first trauma. And, not necessarily, okay, so, not, not necessarily okay. the first trauma, the worst trauma, the one that causes the most PTSD symptoms. Okay. And and you would define the worst trauma as the one that's like the most nightmares, the most flashbacks, the most, is, yeah. is that, is that correct? Yeah. How do you, def yeah. or how would you define it? Well, we measured the PTSD and, and so we asked them, I mean, we might do a trauma timeline because most of the people who come for treatment have had more than one trauma happen to them it's rare to see somebody come to treatment with only one trauma right so you would do um you would do like a P pcl or what would you do we to do kind a PCL of once we identify what we would call what their index event is the one that causes the most ptsd symptoms Okay. So they might have had, they might have been molested as a child or had a car accident before that, but then they have something much worse happen to them, like a rape or domestic violence or something like that. And then even within domestic violence, we would pick out the worst of the incidents. Mm -hmm. to focus in on not just like domestic violence generally or child abuse generally, but pick out the one where they thought they were going to die or they thought their children were going to get abused or killed or something like that. I mean, you know, there's something that would be markedly different and more traumatic about, and that's where we would start is the one that causes the most PTSD symptoms, if we can identify it. Yeah. I remember it, I used to work in the VA back, back when I was a resident, there was one patient in, in particular, it's like the events that I would find that would be that pinnacle event would often be tied to, they felt they had done something really wrong. Like Very I, awesome. I did something that killed my friend or I did something that and this incredible guilt, this incredible um, shame around that event. You want to speak to that? Yeah. When I st first started, as I said, I first started working with rape victims and then, um, you know, eventually we started opening up to any kind of interpersonal trauma. And then I moved to the VA in Boston and same thing with the veterans. I mean, um, we already knew at that point then that, um, that 
other other kinds of traumas were producing the same kind of thinking um, that very often people would say, let me back up a step. Um, they would say things like, I'm, I should have done this, or I should have done that, or I could have stopped it if only I had done this or that. They go back and try to redo the event and try, it's like trying to unring the bell. Um, and and mm. a lot of that comes from having um, the, the fact that we're all raised with the just world belief um, that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've had a fairly nice life and bad things haven't happened to you, when something bad happens to you, you want to keep that belief intact. So you say, I must have done something wrong or I'm being punished. Mm. So I've got to figure out what I did wrong so I don't do it again. So bad things won't happen to me. Mm -hmm. Now, it's also possible that you could start out if you've been abused your entire life like from, from birth, you know, you've been emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused. You might start out from that negative position than any other traumas that happened. You would just be more confirmation of that set of beliefs that you have that I'm worthless or bad things will happen to me because there's something wrong with me or, you know, the, mm -hmm. all that negative kinds of beliefs. But they still say, why me? Why does this keep happening to me? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so what do you do? How do you help someone through that? Well, you, I mean, it's the same process. You help them go through what is their thinking about it. So one of the first assignments we give them when they start CPT um, is to write an impact statement about the event that we've identified. We just, we're, we're starting with one so it isn't too vague because um, it's really hard to take on somebody's whole life. So we pick out the what we consider like the worst because you're going to get a domino effect. If you can start with the one that causes them the most nightmares, flashbacks and so forth. And we have them write what we call an impact statement. Why do you think this event happened specifically? And, and then we have them write about, and what if the, if, what are the effects of having that happen to you? And that's where we get to those over accommodated statements. Well, because this happened, I don't trust anybody or I don't, I don't trust my own judgment or I stay home all the time because I'm in danger. Every place feels dangerous mm -hmm. to me, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, so we've got these five themes that we have them write about safety, trust, power and control, esteem and intimacy. Um, they're very hierarchical um and that so, that's the that's the how this has impacted them in the five the, in those yeah, five areas those five, those five areas yeah okay and so they start with a writing like a paragraph or a paper one page on why they think that this event happened yeah and and explain to me the thought process just um about why the why is so important well, that's where the, that's where the therapy starts is working on whatever beliefs they have about why that trauma happened, because the chances are if they were trying to keep their old belief system intact, then they've distorted the event to fit that belief system. They're trying to figure out where to put it in their brain. So they say, I must have done something wrong. It must be my fault. I should have been able to save that person if only I had done this. And so that's where we take them back. and start, That's where the therapy starts. Um, with Socratic questioning and like, okay, so how far away were you from that person? Could you have gotten to them in time to save them? Well, if you were by, if you were stationed behind the house, how and you didn't know anything was going wrong till you heard the shots, how could you have been up there saving him? You know, those kinds of questions. So you, you help them expand the picture of what happened to them out, so they can see that their logic is not working. Um, and then when they change what they're saying to themselves, it changes their emotion about it. Instead of feeling guilt and shame, they may feel grief and sad, um, mm. which is not a bad outcome because if they need to be grieving somebody, that's where they need to be. All right. Sometimes with rape victims, they go from blaming themselves to suddenly feeling angry and outraged. And that's okay too. It's like, he did this to me. Oh, mm. you know, I can't believe he did this to me. Um, but they're what, putting blame where it belongs. What what if they said, uh, like, you know, a common thing I'll hear is I, I froze and I didn't, you know, in the midst of this event, I froze and I just didn't, I didn't say anything. I should have, I should have screamed. I should have kept telling them to stop. I should have, what, what do you say to someone in that? Well, you don't say anything. You ask questions. <laughs> I mean, the only saying it would be some education. It's like there's, 
there's a fight flight and then there's a freeze response and there's two kind of freeze responses one is what you were just describing is like an orienting response like what's going on here like mm -hmm. the event is a surprise to them maybe not mm -hmm. to the person who's committing the act but it's a surprise to them um and they're like what's happening here and so mm -hmm. they, they freeze for a second and they and then they blame themselves for having a normal physiological reaction um, the other kind of freeze response is happens later when the fight and free fight and flight fail and the event continues on, then they might dissociate and then they're, they're kind of frozen in their dissociation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that especially is true when people are abused a lot as children, they can't fight, they can't flee. So they dissociate. Um, and, you know, it's a different physiological reaction. Instead of having the blood go out to their hands and feet to get them to fight and freeze, it goes back to the core so they don't bleed mm. out. Um, mm. The endorphins kick in to, to stop the pain. Um, and then they have that, that sense of when you've got that kind of almost a morphine response, it, you know, it, that's the sensation of dissociating. Um, mm -hmm. And... And, and if somebody learns to do that a lot, then later that becomes what what their automatic response is. It's not fight or or flee, it's freeze um, and dissociate. Mm. Which, of course, as, as an adolescent would put you at greater risk for having something happen to you another time because you're not stopping it. The event goes on without you. Okay, so you're using, you're using Socratic questioning. You're using, mm -hmm. a, you know, gentle questioning trying to trying to like understand more about the situation mm -hmm. um and so like let's say they say something like yeah you know I, I was like i wasn't expecting this to happen and then all of a sudden like i just kind of remember like i couldn't talk and i couldn't say anything yeah we do a little education there we talk about the fight and flight and freeze response but we also talk about when when your amygdala lights up, which is what gets that fight flight response going, the prefrontal cortex turns off. Broca's area, your speech area is in your prefrontal cortex. So if they have speechless horror, that's not surprising because that got shut down. You don't need to be thinking about your philosophy of life when you're supposed to be fighting or fleeing. So right. it, it is very hard to think. And normally with a normal fight flight response, what happens is that when the danger is over with, um, then the, the brain comes back online and things calm down. Like if you have an almost car accident, everybody's had that kind of response uh, at some time in their life or the other, but it, things calm down and goes back online. That circuit is closed again. And it says to the amygdala shut down, you're not in danger anymore. You don't have to be in a panic mode. Um, mm -hmm. And then it changes all the neurotransmitters that are going through and you calm back down again. With somebody with PTSD, and particularly if they've had a number of things happen to them, um, it goes offline and you don't get that final closing of the loop because the prefrontal cortex actually goes so dark that they're, they're just like frozen there. Um, mm -hmm. So it takes them much longer. It's very easy to get them activated and very slow to get them to shut down. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And what, um, is, is there a different tech, is there different sort of techniques with someone who heavily dissociates in your perspective? I read in one of your, in your, in your manual here, you talk about how the writing portion of CPT was more helpful in people who have heavy dissociation. Um, can you well, uh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, we did a we did what we call a dismantling study, the second study I did, um, because people were saying back then this is just still fear and anxiety, and it's the written portion of the account that that is actually habituating their fear, and this is still about all about fear circuitry. And I kept thinking, no, oh, it's about the cognitive therapy, I think, but we'll we'll see. So I had one condition where we did the full protocol with written accounts. We did that across two sessions and they would read it to themselves every day after they wrote it. And, um, and then we had one condition that was the cognitive therapy only, no written accounts. And then I had a written account only therapy where they would write their accounts for an hour in the session then read it back to the therapist and read it between sessions. No cognitive therapy. 
So overall, we found out that the doing it without the accounts um, had a faster recovery. I mean, they, they were showing clinically significant improvement by session four. Um, and it took longer when they wrote the accounts to catch up. And then there was no value added from having written the accounts. The exception to that was the high dissociators, not low dissociators or medium dissociators, but in the high dissociation group, they seemed to need to write their accounts before you did the cognitive therapy. So there, that original protocol worked best with high dissociators, probably because their memory, when it had been put into their mm -hmm. uh, into their storage, um, was very fragmented because when you're dissociating during mm. an event, things are coming in in a very fragmented way. So by writing their account and getting everything, the beginning, the middle, the end, you've got the whole story. Now you can do the cognitive therapy and help them look at it. Um, mm. So that was the one group that really seemed to do better. Most other groups do better or there's no difference if they do their account or not written account or not. Okay. So normally, they, you know, the therapist will ask them, do you want to write your account or not write your account? We had about a 15% lower dropout rate when they didn't write the account. Mm -hmm. So that that's the, the main part of the manual is without the accounts. But sometimes people want to write. They'll say, I'd like to write. I'd like to have this document. Okay, we'll do it that way. Okay. And... um when you think about cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure, um, and I know you've compared them in studies, like what do you find the difference between those two approaches are? Well, the, the cognitive processing therapy is really focusing a lot more on the cognitions that they, you know, helping them think through what they've been saying to themselves, which they probably came up with at the time of the event or shortly thereafter. So it might've been very, childlike or adolescent kind of thinking it's my fault i should have done something wrong or i'm being punished or whatever it happens to be and then you help them think through that that's probably not the case you know they have the event happened in spite of them not because of them mm. and exposure therapy is having them go through the event in detail feeling their emotions habituating to the emotions and then they start thinking about things differently. Um, and in fact, they, they found that the, even with uh, prolonged exposure, um, cognitions change before the PTSD symptoms go down. So hmm. it, it seems to have the same effect that you're keeping, you're keeping them online by talking through their event. Mm -hmm. I mean, in both cases, if you want to use that biological model, you're keeping their prefrontal cortex online mm -hmm. by making them use their words and talking, um, whether it's the prolonged exposure. And you're not having them do it just in their imagination. You're having them tell the story to the therapist out loud. So they have to use their words. They have to keep their prefrontal cortex online. Yeah. yeah. That helps them start thinking through. Now, some people who are doing, I think, more recently people are adding a fair amount of cognitive therapy in the, after they do the exposures. <laughs> oh, okay. So they're not, they're not sticking to just doing exposures. And what do you think of, um, that you'll have to forgive me. I, I, I went to this conference when I was a, a resident and there was so much hoorah around, you know, other types of trauma therapies. Like you have to get into the brainstem, you have to do, EMDR. And I was almost surprised when I read recently this meta-analysis that compared like more of a cognitive approach like yours to EMDR. I'm wondering if you could speak to kind of like what you've seen in your career as like new approaches have come up and um, how you might advocate for yours compared to other approaches. <laughs> um, there, there, There's a lot of debate about EMDR. Um, it does have a cognitive component to it and it does have an exposure component to it. And there've been some studies that said it doesn't matter what you do. And in fact, I, I was at a conference this year that said, yeah, the tapping actually doesn't make any difference. They were talking, trying to do tapping instead of the eye movements and saying that doesn't, that doesn't help any. Hmm. Um, some of the studies haven't been the same quality. So it depends on which meta-analysis you read and which and which of the treatment guidelines you read. If you read the um, 
the um, BAs, um, I think it's the BA, DO, DOD treatment guidelines, they don't list EMDR as one of the preferred treatments. It's either CPT or, or, or PE. Um, over in Europe, they use EMDR a lot, and that's in their treatment guidelines. Um, I, I think we would need more research, but think about it this way. If you've got therapists who were never treating the trauma by actually talking about the trauma, um, they're treating PTSD by saying, what would you like to talk about today? They wouldn't get too far. Mm -hmm. And so any therapy that you have that gets them to focus on their trauma and not avoid um, and mm -hmm gives them some support is going to have an effect. Mm. I mean, the fact that they're taking three hours out of their day to drive to the therapist's office, go have an hour therapy session, drive home, pay for the parking. They're already invested in getting better. They're thinking about what happened to them. So mm. it, almost anything you do is going to have some effect. And those are what I think of as the nonspecific effects of treatment. And so anything we do has got to be better than the nonspecific effects of treatment. In other words, you've got to have something that's going to add to that and, mm -hmm. and do better than that. Um, there have not been studies that have compared CPT with EMDR. They've compared it to PE. Um, or they've just done various studies about EMDR. There is one study that I know of that's comparing CPT with EMDR right now, and I don't know what the results of it are. Um, hmm. But sometimes, I mean, the problem is, is getting the funding for it, getting a large enough sample, you know, all those things, having all the bells and whistles that you have to do with a randomized controlled trial to show that you've really controlled for all these other variables. Um, but I'd say therapists who say, oh, I do this and it works, I'd say, sure. Yeah, anything you do is going to have some effect. The question is, is it going to have the best effect? <laughs> or is it is there value added by what you're doing? Yeah, I think I think as a uh, psychiatrist who's actively practicing both psychotherapy and med management, so some of my patients are just med management, uh -huh. uh, I've referred people to EMDR therapists. They come back, some of them get better, some, some haven't, and then I refer them to CPT or some prolonged exposure, you know, it, some it works some some need something else you know sometimes it's the therapist isn't a good fit so, you know like so i'm constantly in this kind of like uh searching for the best therapists or the best people to help a particular person you know well and that's where our research with cpt has been going is to like how do you make it more accessible uh and more acceptable um, to people. I mean, we've found, we've been looking for predictors of treatment outcome. One is, do they do their practice assignments? If they go to CPT or PE and don't do their practice assignments, they're not going to do as well. So they can okay. say they got CPT and it, they may not have really gotten a, a sufficient dose. Mm. Um, it's possible the therapist didn't do a good job because they went after the over-accommodated Mm. stuck points first and didn't actually go back and really treat the trauma itself. And so of course they're going to go back and still be stuck on the, the traumatic event and feel shame and blame about that. Um, so being very Socratic has turned out to be a factor that matters. Um, putting a, the assimilated stuck points before the over accommodated has, we've shown in evidence in uh, research that matters. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, you don't have to have them feeling there are, their big emotions in the therapy session, that doesn't matter. Um, the other thing we've been doing is trying to make it faster. There was one study that we did after my, I've always done twice a week for six weeks on all of my studies, all the way back to since 1994. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean other people do that. But even with that, we were, after we did the first two studies, my study comparing it with prolonged exposure and, and then a, the dismantling study, somebody came in and, and did a couple of things. We've done a couple of things with those combined samples. One was to look at um, length of number of days between sessions. And the, the faster the therapy happened, the better. Hmm. Um, so, you know, like even if they're coming in twice a week, if they miss a week, you know, then 
you know, like if you're only seeing them once a week and they don't and they miss a session or two, then now you've got a real problem because now you're playing catch up like what's happened. They haven't been doing their practice assignments at home. Um, so that they're 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 staying where they are. They're stuck. Um, yeah. But that led us to doing faster and faster therapies. The other thing um, that we learned um well, we learned that doing it faster makes a difference. I'm trying to, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I can, I can, I can jump in then. Um, I'm, I'm curious. So like when you say we're doing faster and faster therapy, so you're doing like two week long every day, a session. Yeah. Yeah. Two weeks um, down. And the only randomized control that's been done with really fast therapy I did it in a week. Um, and that and, one hasn't been published yet. Um, and, like, it, Really, it, 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 the dropout is so low when you do it fast. Um, and that's the, that's the other thing I was going to say is that um, much lower dropout rates when you do it quickly. So if you can have people come in and do it every day for two weeks, or even they set aside, they did this study at uh, Fort Belvoir, one of my colleagues, um, Jen Watchin was the PI on this study, the principal investigator, and they did it in a week compared to the six week version and no differences in outcomes, but they were, there was only a 5% dropout rate. It was mm. tiny um, compared to regular and, and, and at Ohio state um, uh, Craig Bryan did a study where he was looking at it across a couple of weeks, but he compared um, the mass treatment to doing it weekly um, and 33% dropout rate if you do it weekly and almost no dropout rate if you do it daily. And and what, and if you're doing it, like what percentage of people compared to wait list or compared to no therapy, like are getting better? Like what is, cause I, I read this big meta analysis on CBT for depression mm -hmm. and recently came out this last year it was like 10,000 plus people you know it was like 20 percent out of the group got better like got into remission for depression 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 yeah and with doing what was this medication C or therapy? No, C cbt cbt 12 12 session CBT. um we don't do that for depression we use it for ptsd <laughs> it could be a problem <laughs> Right. No, no, no. Not CBT. Sorry. CBT. CBT. Cognitive okay. behavioral therapy. Just basic yeah. cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. So I'm curious, like what? Well, we what... do better than that. Yeah. Um, there is a difference. I mean, we uh, it depends on the study, but we know that civilians tend to do better than um, veterans in active duty. But we're at least 50 percent. Um, some studies have had up to 75 percent. And if we do it variable length, um, it it's closer to 80% are losing their PTSD diagnosis and, 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 and getting not, not just to their scores down, but getting to a good end state where you'd say they don't have PTSD at all. Um, and variable length means that you're not doing a set 12 sessions that they may get done sooner. It may take them a few sessions longer, but you base it on their scores on their PCL is how long you should go which is I think often what happens in, in, in a therapy setting anyway. Yeah. Um, the set 12 sessions is often because you're doing research and you're comparing two things. So they have to be the same. Wow. And that, that seems very short and fit, you know, 50% is impressive. Even if it's 50, just 50%, like that's an impressive amount of people getting out of PTSD. Yeah. Well, losing your diagnosis is one thing, but I mean, we always measure it in multiple ways. You say how many people lost their diagnosis, how many people um, got, uh, had a clinically significant improvement. And then ultimately how many people have a, a good end state, which means their scores are really low. Their, their depression score on like on the BDI, the Beck depression inventory would be below 10 and their PCL would be below 19. I mean, that you're in pretty good shape if you've got those things. So you're saying really good end state. Um, but, and that's where the variable length seems to do better. I feel like a lot of trauma oriented 
therapy is like somatic experiencing or body therapy or actually in your manual i was reading you will ask people what they're feeling in their body you want to oh, talk yeah. about that at all absolutely it's like, like it's like some of those people say like oh the cognitive people all they do is talk about thoughts you know but i'm like reading in your manual like no you you ask people oh. what they're feeling in their body sure. so and you are we have, we have a whole emotion we only teach them how to identify their emotions and, and yes how that how it feels in their body and that kind of stuff but we're not laying hands on um and the cognitive therapy is to get them to reason through they have to figure out how to think about it differently. So we're teaching them a set of skills. We're teaching them to think in a more balanced way. We're teaching them to take all the factors that were about that trauma into account when they think about the trauma, not just their flashback or their guilt or whatever it happens to be. So we put all the rest of the picture together by asking lots of questions. And then we see if that changes that, you know, what else could you say to yourself? And how do you feel when you say that? If you say it wasn't my fault or I did the best I could or I didn't see it coming and I froze and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't me. It was the event. Um, there's no way I could have saved that person. How does that feel? So, yeah, we do, we do talk about, especially we talk about how does it feel in your body when they're having trouble identifying emotions how does fear feel different than anger? How does, mm -hmm. how does sadness feel different than those other two? Um, when you're feeling shame, how do you feel? You know, so yeah, sometimes we focus on that more when they have trouble identifying emotions. Some people are, you know, like specialize in anger <laughs> or some people feel nothing but shame and guilt. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what would you say, uh, how might you help a patient who has a hard time experiencing experiencing anger at all maybe because it, developmentally anger was not a helpful emotion to experience in their family unit like how, you know and now you're in the trauma and it's like dissociations there a lot but it's really hard to get to any anger well i mean we you don't push the anger you just say you know if you thought it was their fault instead of your fault how would you feel you know like we reason mm prove that it isn't their, their fault by asking lots of questions. It's like, what was your, what were you thinking was going to happen that day? What was your intent for that day to turn out? And, and so that it turned out this way. So who actually has the blame? So how do you feel that this person did this to you? I mean, they don't, they might feel sad. They might feel angry. we don't push anger. Um, but if they feel it, say, yeah, that's righteous anger. Um, that's okay to feel that and then help them differentiate. I mean, we have lots of people who have too much anger and they get aggressive. Our, our prisons are filled with people with PTSD. Mm, yeah. Because, because they lash out in anger and they harm somebody and then they're in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So, and CPT is being used in, in prisons. It's being used a lot across the, um, um, the correction system now. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. How do you teach practitioners to use Socratic questioning? <laughs> well, that comes through the work, doing the workshop and then it comes through doing a uh, case consultation because I, I think that's the only thing that's really difficult. Everything else is like, do this session one, do this session two, make sure they're doing their practice assignments. Don't, don't let them get away with not doing the practice because their life is out there in the world. Um, and they bring their worksheets in and that's the meat of the session. That's what they're going to be working with in the session. So if they're not doing that, that's a problem. But then the only other hard thing is like getting them to, um, helping them to, um, to, to think about it differently and learn the skill of thinking about it differently. Um, and that you have to do with by asking questions, not trying to convince them. You can't say to somebody, this isn't your fault. They'll just go, yeah, you weren't there. You don't know. you know, Because um, other people have said that to them. Okay. So we teach them these skills one by one. How do I, 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 what's the difference between an event and your thought? In other words, a fact and an opinion. And then when you say this to yourself and you feel this, 
Or you think this, how do you feel? And if you said something else to yourself, how would you feel? So we might use an everyday example to help them see that if you, they said something else to themselves, they'd feel differently. So we're doing all this stuff and teaching questions. So we show during the workshops, we show lots of videos, we have them role play. Um, we have a new, the, you held up the treatment manual. We have a new manual coming out in April and we've gotten rid of the word challenge completely. Hmm. Uh, Cause we used to call it challenging questions and challenging beliefs, worksheets and faulty thinking patterns. I've taken all of that out of there. Um, mm -hmm. So, because that's, even though we're trying to think about them challenging their thinking, that sounds aggressive. That sounds um, adversarial. So we've just gotten rid of that. Now we say exploring questions mm. and alternative thoughts worksheet and thinking patterns. And we just like totally wiped out the word challenge out of that whole manual because sometimes people make, therapists make this mistake by trying to be too convincing. Mm. But don't you think you could have done this or you couldn't have done that? Or, you know, like they, they're so eager to get them better that they get pushy. <laughs> And that's that's a, one of the main mistakes that people do instead of being quietly Socratic and gently asking questions, because the answer is inside that person. And they're going to have to convince themselves The therapist can't convince them. Yeah. How do you or what are some other issues that you see that are common mistakes when people are trying to learn this approach? Um, well, I, I mean, one of the main ones is not sticking to the protocol, you know, having poor fidelity. Um, they just, they'll say, oh, I think I'll add this in the middle of the therapy. And, mm -hmm. you know, the therapy was has been tested with many, many randomized control trials. We have, uh, you know, we have changed it over time, but we've changed it and tested it over time. And so if somebody just like goes off on a tangent and starts adding other things, they're not doing CPT anymore. And so yeah. that could be a mistake is not, not having good fidelity to the manual that they're jumping over things um, and not doing it in the sequence it was intended um, because we're systematically trying to teach them how to think in a more balanced, more factual way. And that'll change their thinking. And then the PTSD symptoms go away. Um, I mean, even, even their arousal and, and, you know, startle responses go away if they're successful at doing CPT. Mm -hmm. So it really does change not just their thinking and their emotions, but even their physiological reactions. Okay. Yeah. What are some other common stuck points that we haven't discussed? Cause I feel like that's like so essential in this approach is to find those stuck points, those erroneous beliefs that date back to the time of the trauma. Well, I, I mean, it depends on, it depends on, I mean, I, I mentioned that just world. That's that's the the, the go to is I must have made a mistake or I must have done something wrong or I'm being punished. But people often try to go back and kind of like try to undo the event in some way. If only I had done this, or if only I had done that, I could have saved them, or I could have prevented it, or I should have known. Um, we call it hindsight when somebody say says I should have known. Maybe I really did know. You know, I shouldn't have been there. I should have known that, that it was a dangerous place to be. Um, so they're trying to undo the event after the fact, which you can't do. Mm. Uh, so it, it's, it's not just that they're feeling shame and guilt about what happened to them, but they also try to like undo it by, by the, the statements they make themselves. If only I had done this or that, that kind of thing. Um, or even real simple, just outcome based reasoning something bad happened to me, therefore it must be my fault. And it depends on how they were raised, but if they were raised in a, an emotionally abusive home, they probably were taught that everything was their fault. Hmm. And so that's their, that's going to be their go-to. So there's something, it seems like once those beliefs are there, it's like that trauma is not resolving until you, you know, put those beliefs, let's see adjust those beliefs, put them on trial. I like to say put them on trial, but maybe that's <laughs> yeah, too. You could, you could say that. Um, but also putting, putting, getting them to put it back in the context of what actually happened as opposed to the way they think about the trauma. So they leave out the important facts, like mm. how big they were. Um, or, how big they were. Yeah, well, you know, like if you're abused by somebody who's much bigger than you, 
I've seen people who left out the fact that there was three people holding them down with a gun at their head. Hmm. You know, I should have fought harder. Well, tell me how you could have fought harder. I should have hmm. punched him. Where were your arms? I was being held down. Well, how could you punch him if your, your arms were being held down? Um, so, you know, like just helping them think through what actually happened hmm. and that they can't make those assumptions given what actually happened. And now this, as you can hear, the Socratic questioning is not getting into the blood and the guts and the gore and the terror. It's talking about the facts of the event. So you're right. In a sense, you're helping them put it on trial. But by by putting in all the stuff they've left out, all the stuff that made it happen the way it happened, and what their intent was, and what the other people's intent was, or maybe there's no intent if it's an accident, but mm -hmm. they didn't have the intent for the trauma. Right. Okay. So, so one thing that you, you talk about is that as providers, we need to not be afraid of asking really maybe taboo questions. So specifically around sexual abuse or rape, what are some of the taboo questions that you have found helpful? Well, taboo. Yeah. I think if you ask in, in, in a gentle way and you're asking Socratic questions, you can ask anything. So in terms of sexual abuse, especially with boys, they almost always have had arousal as part of the, the abuse. And so they think they're a pervert because they've felt arousal. I, I've seen rapists who intentionally um, caused arousal with the victim. And so then they feel like they, they it can't be a rape because they were aroused during the event and having them understand the difference between pleasure and arousal hmm. as two and things entirely you can torture people with arousal yeah I, I think i think that's so helpful so there's it's like you can feel disgust while you're aroused you can feel something is very unwanted while you're aroused exactly so you're um, saying was that pleasurable no okay so that person made you feel aroused but that wasn't pleasurable and you didn't choose it so that's very different than lovemaking isn't it so we're helping them kind of see the difference between and but if you don't ask those questions you can't even talk about that mm -hmm. so so if it's fine to you know if they're feeling guilt or if they're stuck i mean sometimes people are afraid to bring that up but sometimes they will bring it up and but like with a a, a boy who's been sexually abused now as a grown-up it, it almost ought to be a standard question were you sexually aroused during the event? Did they do this to you? Because the, their conclusion is going to be, I was a participant. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that makes me a pervert. Right. Yeah. Or a monster or whatever it happens to be. Now, that isn't always the case with women who were abused as children. But sometimes with, the, you know, like with child sexual abuse, there's a grooming process. There's a good, yeah, yeah. And they're giving awesome. them pleasure and, and hugging Attention. them. And, and giving them attention and being very loving. And then they just kind of slowly go along. And then she thinks she's a, a participant. Sometimes the most traumatic event for them is when they finally say no, and it happens anyway. Oh, oh. That may be, that may be their index event. Oh, so yeah. What, yeah. The, the grooming aspect seems very, I don't know that it's just disturbing for me. Like, read recently about this uh, kind of religious figure that groomed this young 14 year old girl and mm -hmm. just reading the, the full account of it just left me with this like bad taste in my mouth and just yeah. awful. Yeah. And that's why as a therapist, we, you can't shy away from that stuff, but we may need to talk to somebody else about it when we're hearing it because we're hearing it secondhand, but we have a reaction too. Mm hmm. Um, so I think that's why sometimes getting consultation can be helpful if you haven't been working with trauma victims before and you're hearing these stories. Sometimes therapists, I think that's a therapist mistake is to stay away from the trauma. And there's an awful lot of people that say, what would you like to talk about today? And they're afraid to go there. Or they think we've got to spend a long time getting ready for therapy. They'll talk about stage-based therapy. We got to get them ready. I think that's the therapist getting themselves ready. Oh. Um, Wow. You know, they're procrastinating. 
Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was talking to a, a new client. I'm going to change some variables, but they basically said, you know, it's interesting. Like you're asking me questions about the actual trauma where I've been in therapy for years and no one is asking me actually what happened. Yeah. And I was like struck by like, what? Like, how does that, but that I think you're right. All, like you have, it's, it's like, yeah, it, especially if you're traumatized by hearing someone's trauma story it's like i don't know if i want to go back into someone's trauma that was an awful experience um but i think that's where you're that's where the training and the supervision and case consultation come in is so important and if you uh -huh. can't handle that stuff you shouldn't be doing this kind of therapy which is fine go work in another area of psychopathology don't work with with trauma victims um there's nothing wrong with not doing trauma work but I, you've I, got to be you got to be able to do it. <laughs> okay. So I've heard from other new providers like, oh, I don't think I could do this work. You know, like, I don't think I could ever be trained because I'm a sensitive person. What might you say to that person to maybe well, give them some confidence that? Yeah, I, I, I tend to remind them that it isn't their trauma and you're feeling feelings for them isn't and putting yourself in their shoes is not going to help them. They got to feel their own feelings. That's their event. You've got your own events in life that you need to deal with. They've got their events in life. You can't feel their feelings for them. So if they're reading an account, if they're doing the version with the account, and they're sitting there listening to the account, I'll actually give them advice on what to think about. Instead of putting themselves in their shoes and feeling their feelings, you said you felt sick to your stomach. But if you were listening to somebody's account directly, I'd be saying to, to you, okay, what are their stuck points? What are the parts that they've left out before when they wrote their impact statement? Where are you going to start your Socratic questioning? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. So it's it's like sometimes grounding yourself in a model in a way of asking things can be um, soothing to your own internal distress. It's like, okay, right. it's, like, it's like the same thing if I was in a code. Okay, what's their blood pressure? What's their heart rate? What's their, you know... Like, it's like I may ground myself in some of the basics to kind mm -hmm. of like move through that yes. life and death situation. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I would help, I, you know, obviously that's where the supervision comes in. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? And and the best cure for for feeling horrible is to see it through the outcome and see them get better. Mm. I mean, PTSD is treatable. It's very treatable. And we don't see relapse. We've tracked people for five to 10 years later and don't see relapse. That's thrilling as a therapist. Yep. Yeah. So even though you're hearing a horrible story, you do, you do accommodate to those horrible stories after you've heard a few, but, but getting your mind focused on what are you going to do to help them get past that? Right. Um, and, and fill out the story and, and be thinking about like, okay, so they're blaming themselves, but why are they blaming themselves? Like what happened here that it would be their fault? What was their intent? Did they have any options? What options did they have? Um, and that's where you want to have, you, you want to be actively thinking while they're giving you their story. And that active thinking activates your, your, your frontal lobe, right? Because you're exactly. planning. And exactly. so it keeps you from dissociating. And keeping, um, keeping the emotions in check. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go talk to somebody else. It's like a game of telephone. If you go talk to a therapist, you know, like a colleague or something and tell them that story, it's not going to affect them as much as it affected you hearing it, which, which yes. isn't as bad as the person who experienced it. Exactly. You know, I, I've, I find having good friends who are therapists and colleagues that I discuss things with. I, I tell I tell my residents I teach a psychotherapy, I say, if there's ever a story that you're up in the middle of the night thinking about, that's the one to bring to supervision. Yeah. Good suggestion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Any like as we kind of wrap up our time, any any final things you that we didn't hit that you definitely wanted to mention? And then um and then maybe we'll mention like next steps for people who are thinking about learning more. Okay. Um no, I think we've kind of talked about the kind of the overview. I mean, the therapy, as I said, is very systematic. If you've been trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, I think, and especially if you've been trained in cognitive therapy, it's pretty easy to pick up the manual and do it. But I do strongly recommend if you want to get 
on the provider roster so that you get referrals, go through mm. go through the two day training and get the case consultation, make sure you're doing it with fidelity and with competence. Um, and then we put you on the provider roster, mm -hmm. not, not until you've completed at least two cases. Um, and, um, you know, this is being done all over the world. So this isn't just like a, a an American therapy. It's been done in at least six low resource countries um, successfully. I mean, sometimes you have to, and, and uh, Western countries like Germany and, and Australia and Canada, of course, are, it's easily translated. Although in German, mm -hmm. getting them big words onto that little um, worksheet is sometimes a little tough. Um, or translating something like stuck point. But other than that, they've been able to stick to the protocol and do it very well. In some of the low resource countries, they've had to adapt because they, the clients or the patients were illiterate. And so they had to make it verbal or use pictures. Okay. Okay. Um, and and so they, they kept the bones of the therapy, but they've had to modify it to fit um, yeah. the, 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 the culture that they're working in. Um, the other thing we've done recently is that th there there is a huge shortage of qualified therapists in this country and everywhere else. Um, so recently, this last April, almost a year ago, we published a self-help book um, and we're getting good reviews on that. People are using it and therapists are actually using it with their patients, you know, mm -hmm. it makes for a good handout, uh, you know, this, this one getting unstuck. Yeah. For somebody who doesn't have access to a therapist, can't afford a therapist. I mean, th therapy's gotten easier to do with telehealth. It works just as well with telehealth as it does um, because we have a we have an app where it has all the worksheets on it and so forth. Yep. Um, and they yep. can email and they can email you know through a safe server um, the the worksheets ahead of time or their their PCL the. PTSD uh, checklist to their therapist before the session starts. They've even done group therapy with telehealth. Mm -hmm. um, but which means that the distance might not matter as long as they have access to a tablet or, and, and have Wi-Fi that's sufficient. Um, but if you can't get a therapist at all, or if somebody's on a long waiting list, instead of putting them into some kind of holding group, I mean, we're starting to look at, there's some studies that are starting to look at, um, instead of getting them something else, have them do the self-help book first um, and start on the therapy. Yeah. Or I would say, you know, get the self-help book. And then when you get to one of these stuck points in your memory, like bring that into your therapist and say, hey, exactly. this is what I want to work on. I feel a lot of guilt about this specific thing. Yeah. And you could be a proactive patient in that way. Mm -hmm. And you know, you could tell your therapist like, Hey, I want to talk. I think this is the seminal event and I want to talk about it. And this is my stuck point. And uh, can you help me? Yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately when, when I develop CPT and I tell everybody that my goal is always to have them not need a therapist, you know, that they're going to learn enough skills. And that's why we don't see a lot of relapse because once people have learned the skills of thinking more factually, um, yep taking their thoughts to trial, as you would say, and, and checking them out. Once they learn how to do that, they manage. We've had people who go back to war and get deployed again. They said, I didn't get PTSD this time. You know, they'll, they'll call their or email their therapist and said, you know, like it really worked. I had another trauma and nothing. I, I dealt with it totally differently. So that's why we ended up thinking like, if our goal is to have them not need a therapist, why shouldn't we be able to do a self-help book and get them to the point where they don't need a therapist Anyway, now some people definitely need a therapist. I mean, when mm -hmm. I looked at the reviews on Amazon, somebody said this really was good, but I do it with a therapist or do it with someone. I don't. Other I don't think any. I don't think anything's going to replace a therapist because there's <laughs> something about the human to human connection um, that is so powerful. Well, and I think also the avoidance is one of the big problems with PTSD. I'll be interested to see how well the book the 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 book works without a therapist. Um, and there's some studies that are starting to, to look at that because the avoidance is the biggest enemy. And if you just stick it on the shelf and don't do the, the practice assignments, it's not going to work. 
Um, and that's where the therapist who's checking on, did you do your practice assignments? Did you do enough worksheets this week? Let's go through mm -hmm. those worksheets. So moving it along can be very helpful. Do you, do you have time for one more question or shall we wrap okay. it up here? No, we're fine. Okay. What do you think? So there was this book called The Great Psychotherapy Debate. Um, and it was talking about the kind of like therapist effect, right? That there's mm -hmm. these these common factors, these factors that are not necessarily modality that make the biggest difference. And it seems like in some of the studies that you've done where you're comparing, you know, different types of therapy, they're all, there seems, they seem to be pretty similar, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so recently I came upon this study that looked at therapist effect and it looked at specifically reflective function, which is measured by the adult attachment interview. Mm -hmm. And it found that this had 70.5% to do <laughs> with what made the best therapist. Okay. Uh -huh. So, you know, reflective function. So people, the, the therapists, you know, had a bunch of patients, they measured the OQ45 and they looked at some therapists had better, faster outcomes on their group of patients than other ones. Mm -hmm. And they took every therapist and they had them do the adult attachment interview. And then based off of the transcript of their of the therapist's adult attachment interview, they did a measure called the reflective function, which is like, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I wasn't a couple of weeks ago either, so it's okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's basically like how well they were able to reflect upon their own internal state and their parents' internal state um, in the adult attachment interview. And mm -hmm. it scored from like, negative one to nine. And if you were below average, none of your patients got better. If you were average to uh, a little bit below seven, then your patients got better at kind of an average rate. But if you were a, a seven, eight, or a nine, which are the three highest scores, your patients got better quite a bit faster on the OQ45. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you have any reflections over the years on this idea of therapist effects and specifically like as I'm reading your manual and I'm with this understanding of therapist effect, I mean, some of what we're, some of what the therapists are naturally doing with your approach is actually very high. It's a higher reflective function ability to be able to look at someone's experience and, and do the Socratic questioning. Anyways, I'm, I'm curious. I'll let you I'll let you share what you yeah, think. I can I can see that because there's some people who you can tell immediately they're going to do CPT really well. Mm. And and they gravitate to it. It makes perfect sense to them. And they love doing the Socratic resting with the clients. And there's other therapists who really struggle with it. I mean, you know, when we do training, it's not that everybody finishes the training. Some people just don't mm. do it. So I can see that there'd be differences in therapists. Um and um it'd be interesting using that to test people when they come into <laughs> to graduate school or oh. residency or whatever, just, you know, to see if they've got what it takes, um, especially with trauma. Um, yeah, ab absolutely. I think, I think that without knowing about it, when we would interview people, if they had lower ability to talk about their life, lower ability, like to reflect upon, you know, as they, if, mm -hmm. if their answers seemed very rehearsed in the interview, we rated them lower, but if they had a higher ability to talk and conversate and mm -hmm. introspect, but also like read the interviewer, right. That's part of reflective function. Mm -hmm. um, then we were more interested in getting them into our program. So I think <laughs> it's probably taking place to some degree. Uh -huh. Um, like uh, one one study was that prisoners had a, a three on the reflective function, which is pretty low. Mm -hmm. Whereas inpatient psychiatric patients had like an average of like four. Mm -hmm. So anyway, anyways, okay. So you had some thoughts there. Okay, to wrap this up, um, any any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Where where no, people that, could go? That's interesting. Hopefully, hopefully, when we do training, we're teaching some. I don't know if that's a uh, a, a factor that can be modified in therapists. Um, but hopefully when we're teaching CPT, we would be teaching some of those things. I, I think that it can. Um, and I think this is where, like, there are studies where people like borderline precise order, they go through transference focused therapy and through that they go from a three to a four. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. through therapy. So I think that there is this idea of doing your own work in psychotherapy. Like, for example, I imagine if you had uh, someone who goes through your program and they're like, I have a lot of traumas I haven't worked through. Maybe I should work through those because they're getting triggered by yeah. this patient's traumas. Like you'd probably say, yeah, you should probably do some of your own work. Yeah. Before you I, start doing it with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I imagine. But, but also just teaching them how, when you're teaching somebody to do Socratic questioning, you're really teaching them to tune into somebody else and, and, and how they think and stop thinking about yourself. Um, the, right. the therapists who get into trouble or you're sitting there thinking, what am I going to ask next? And they're not listening to the answer that they just mm. asked. Um, as opposed to if you're really listening to the, the, the patient, they would be telling you the next question to ask by what they just said. <laughs> um, so you, you're really learning how you're having to learn how to tune in and really listen to what they're saying and get outside yourself. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think any good supervision that's long, has longevity will increase that ability, you know, mm -hmm. over time. And yeah. So great. Well, wonderful to have you on. Um, you. I want to just plug your, so how would, if, if someone wanted to take one of your trainings, where would they go? Um, we have a website that's called, um, CPT for PTSD. That's all like one word, small letters.com. And okay. we have in there, we have information about, you know, purchasing the books. We've got a discount there. We, they could, there's a, uh, if somebody's looking for a therapist, you can look under the provider roster and you okay. can go by country, state, city zip code if you're looking for a therapist who knows how to do cbt and has gone through the training we don't they don't get on the roster till they've completed the training and then there's also a place for um where people can look for trainings or they can if they want to set up a group training like for a whole program they could contact um through the website great okay well i'm excited to see um how people are gonna sort of dig into this and i, I imagine i mean some of the Many of the things you said were just so helpful, and I think it's going to be a, an amazing uh, podcast to put out there. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you.